organization. It's fantastic. Yeah. But you, uh, you started out humble beginnings. Yeah. Humble I, beginnings in Dallas, Texas, raised by your mother. Yeah. And your you know, Jacob was talking about living in a in a homeless shelter. We lived under a tree. Jacob, you got it on me, baby. You were, very, <laughs> man. You were, you were shopping at Neiman Marcus. I mean. You, you had it made. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that was it. But we didn't know we were poor. Just like Jacob. Jacob was caddying. Mother was trying to make ends meet. They were happy. Uh, you know, you just, you don't know. I mean, you have no earthly idea until you've seen the other side. And once you see the other side, naturally, you, you, you make up your mind whether you want to work extremely hard and, and, and put your nose to the grindstone and see if this is what you're trying to achieve. Most people give up a little too easy. There's no reason to set goals real high. You want to set goals that you can achieve them to feel good about yourself. But I was given a hell of a talent. And I think everyone in this room is born with some type of a talent. It's just if you, if you can just find it and, and, and pursue it. And... And the good Lord gave me a heck of a talent, and, and I took advantage of it. And it was kind of funny that I did that. Yeah. You didn't know what golf was. You, had grew no. up, you grew up near a golf course, but had no idea what golf was. There was a farmhouse. We lived in it, four rooms. Two of them had floors. The other two floors were dirt. There was no electricity, no plumbing. I never witnessed electricity and plumbing until I went in the Marine Corps at 17. And I spent four years in the Pacific. I was a machine gunner. And... I, I mean, are we, th that's just the way that it was. But there was a golf course next door, and I became good friends with the green superintendent's son. And we used to play, and, and, and I picked it up just automatically, started caddying. I remember I, remember I used to caddy for, for three main people. It was, I'll never forget, it was Henry Klepak, which is a lawyer in Dallas, Tex Cold on A&A liquor stores, and Tony Profano which owned the Profano Fur Company, and they played on Saturdays and Sundays, and I went at 5 o'clock in the morning to caddy for them. Uh, the caddy fees were 90 cents. <laughs> 90 cents. I mean, you could buy a lot. I mean, you could buy groceries with 90 cents. Uh, I'm telling you, you, you can't buy a, a stick of gum now with 90 cents, but, but that's just the way that it was at the time. You're a, you're a self-taught player. No. When well, nobody came, could teach the swing I've got. We, no, I know that. That's my point. Uh, uh, Lee Trevino, as you know, is known for this big fade yeah. of, his, of his golf shot. Now, yeah. you were a hooker, pardon the phrase. Yeah. You were a hooker coming out of the Marines. Yeah. And I you became a fader by watching. Well, I, I found out that I couldn't win any money hooking the ball because, as I always said, I said, you can talk to a fade, but a hook won't listen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it just keeps going. And I found out. I actually saw Mr. Hogan hitting practice balls. And it was the first time I started seeing a ball go from left to right. And I had no clue how he did it. And I, wasn't, I was too scared to get near him uh, to ask him how he was doing this and probably wouldn't have given me any, any information anyway. But I went back and started trying to cut the ball. This is after I was out of the Marine Corps. And I was trying to learn how to cut it. And the only way that I could cut it was to aim left, uh, aim to left field, swing to right field, and make the ball go to center field. And it was a block. And that's why I never hit the ball high and I never hit it long is because I blocked it. I didn't release it. Uh, the one thing about blockers is they're extremely accurate. Yeah, you have good control. Very good control. Also, the one thing about blockers also is you're able to hold loft on a golf club. If you start with an open seven iron and instead of having 35 degrees on it, you got 38, you will hold at 38. If you start with it shut a little bit and you've got 33 degrees of loft on it and you hit the ball, you will hold that 33 degrees. When you're a flipper, you may start with 56 degrees on the wedge, but when you hit the ball, you've got 62. We have some flippers right here at this table a right lot here. Of flippers. Don't we? Let me see the show. <laughs> but, and and, and it, Nicholas was a holder. People don't realize that. Uh, Nicholas had a flying elbow. Sure, he had a flying elbow. But you know what? He, once he got the elbow up here, he also had the heel up, and when he set the heel down, the elbow came in. It was just, I mean, it was time perfect, and he cut the ball. He hit a high cut. I hit a power fade, which was lower. I had a very difficult time on hard greens. He hit the ball so high, and there's no reason, I mean, without it, he, he had plenty of talent, but he also won 18 majors, and the reason for it is because he hit the ball so high that it didn't make any difference if the greens were soft or they were hard. 
his ball would stop. But you came out, you had no amateur experience, you had no, no junior experience. Never played an you amateur. You came tournament. on tour, you came on tour, you had no guru, no. you had no masseuse, you no. had no fitness guy, you had no nobody to loof at your stretch marks, you had nobody. <laughs> How in the I world had, did you do it? I had, How did you make it? Well, I, you know, I, I, I was just pretty accurate. And, and, and like I said, I was, I was pretty straight here. I was a bad putter because we, we putted. You know, I was that was that was the whole knock on me when I when I left Tennyson Park in Dallas. They say, I wonder if this guy can't make it. He can hit it here and he can hit these shots and he can do what he wants to with the ball. But he's a bad putter. You gotta understand, we pay, we putted greens at Tennyson Park. I mean, we we didn't have grass. We had Johnson grass, crab grass. We had St. Augustine. Our greens had all this mixture of grasses, and that ball would go across. It was like putting gravel on a pool table. I mean, you just you just it, it went everywhere. And when I went out there and putted good greens, I said, Your eyeballs went like I said, Are you crazy? How the hell do you miss one out here? <laughs> I mean, how do you miss this putt? And I didn't even line up. Notice how fast I used to putt? I couldn't wait to hit it. <laughs> you know, these guys, these guys now, they're going like this. And then they're straddling the line now, and they're going like this. And I, what the hell is all that? Yeah, I don't know what they're doing with all that stuff. And I just, I just, I, I actually read a green when I walk up to it. I already know which way that putt's going. It can be a strange golf course, completely strange, never been on it. Fifty yards away from the green is when you can read a green best. You understand? Don't wait till you get on the green because it all looks flat anyway. But 50 yards away, you can see all the undulation in that green. And all golf courses have a personality. I don't care where you play, there's a point on that golf course that 90% of the putts break that way. They just go that way. And so this is, this is what you look for. Well, when I went out there and, and, and I started putting well, I mean, and also what helped me a lot too, Peter, is that we had a rule back then that if you won a major championship before 1970, you got a, you got a ticket for life. A lot of people don't know that. You got a ticket for life. And when I finished, I've qualified for the U.S. Open at Olympic in San Francisco in 66. I made the cut, but I, I finished 56th in the tournament. I came back and re-qualified, and I went to Boulder Straw, and I finished fifth at Boulder Straw. That got you your card. I got you no, your Well, that card. got me, yes. It didn't get me the card. It got me some invitations to play in some tournaments in 67, the latter part of 67. I ended up playing 13 tournaments, and they voted me Rookie of the Year, and I won $33,000. And I finished 47th on the money list, which they took the top 60. The next year, I went to, I went to Oak Hill in, in uh, Rochester, and I won the tournament. I won the U.S. Open. I shot four rounds in the 60s, first man that's ever done that. And I got a, I got a lifetime exemption. That's a big deal, lifetime exemption. Yeah. When you finished fifth at the Open, Nicholas won. Yes. And then you came back and you beat Nicholas. I beat him at Marion. Second. Yeah, we well, beat him at Marion in the in the playoff. But I beat him at, at Oak Hill. At 68. Oak Hill too. Yeah. He finished second. Yeah. You said many times that he's the one man in the game of golf that you admire most. Yeah, I, I, I admire him not only not as a golfer. I admire him more as a as a family man. Uh, I I was always so tied up in in my game, is that I had four other children besides the two that I have now that. that that I never knew real well, uh, simply because I spent so much time playing and practicing and away from home that they went all through school and college and everything, and I never did do much, of the, much with them. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty good buddies with them now, but not, it's not like I am with the two now. And I, I admired Nicholas because Nicholas, I, I used to watch Nicholas. He'd come to a golf tournament and wouldn't play a practice round because he wanted to watch his daughter play volleyball. And I never could understand that until I got older and I realized in other words, hey, what, a, the, for what all a dad you, he was. Yeah. Hey, Jacob, you're not a Florida State fan, are you? You're a Michigan State fan. I'm not sure if you know this, but Jack Nicholas' grandson plays tight end for Florida State. Nick O'Leary. O'Leary. Yeah. Do you know that? Nick O'Leary. He's is, going. He's going to go to the pros. Oh, yeah, he, that's his grandson. He's as big as a door. Yeah, he's that a good player. He's a, a good player. player. But yeah. the, the the rock in that family, you know and I know, is Barbara. Oh yeah. Barbara has held that family together no, forever. Most, most wives are the rock. Well, that's true. You know, that's we're not true. all that smart. You know, I don't that's care. That's true. <laughs> when you... we're, 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 we're very quick 
we're very quick, in other words, to give you an opinion and to answer something. And, and ladies, they sit back and they, I had a phone call the other day and a guy called me up, uh, Cameron from uh, the sports writer from Colorado. And uh, he made a mistake by leaving me a message. And he says, call me back. He said, I wanted to ask you, do you think that the PGA treated Ted Bishop right? And I went home and I told my wife. And I said, you know, I got to call this guy back. She said, what does he want? I said, well, he asked me about Ted Bishop, you know, getting, getting let go and impeached, they impeached him at the PGA for what he said. My wife says, you don't want to make that phone call. <laughs> and I said, why not? She says, you can't win. <laughs> she says, however you answer that, it's not going to be the right way. You girls. Claudia's a smart you know, guy. That's why, girls. see, that's why, you ever notice that, I tell people, manufacturing golf clubs, I tell people, I said, do you ever notice that, that golf, golf clubs are measured simply because the end of your fingers to the ground is the same distance, whether you're 6'4 or 5'7. Now, you don't realize that. But men, am I right? They're, they're right there, okay? Now, if you stand next to a lady, her hands are closer to the ground than yours. And the, I said, there's two reasons for it. They get shorter golf clubs, and they can reach the bottom of your pocket. That's it. That's it. That's it. I've always said that. Uh, they can get to the bottom of your pocket. Say, when, when, you, when you were in the Marine Corps, I found this fascinating. You played a lot of golf. Last, they asked you, what do you do? Do you play sports? And you said, yes, sir, I play golf. Well, what happened is I was over there, and we were all in the Pacific, and I came back to the U.S., and I decided to go back, and I'm on the troop ship out of San Diego going back to, to Okinawa. And they made my orders got messed up, and they put me in a different company doing a different job. And I was supposed to go into recon and reconnaissance. And I, I was in, in, in special services. And I went get some office hours, and I asked the captain. I said, sir, I said, I was supposed to be with my guys at recon. We were training. And uh, so he says to me, he said, man, he said, I've got to do all this paperwork and everything. He said, all your orders are messed up. He said, do you play a sport? And I said, yes, sir, I'll play golf. So he called Lieutenant Irwin, which was at that time was the California amateur champion, and he was a lieutenant, a lieutenant in, in special services. He said, I got a kid up here. Take him down to Owasi Meadows, see if he can play. And sure enough, I went down there, and I shot 68-77, sand greens, and I made the five-man team, last guy. And in three months, I was number one. I won, uh, I, and we won every, every champion, never lost a team championship, but we never won an individual because Orville Moody was playing for the Army at the time. <laughs> and Orville Moody won every tournament. I mean, we, we played one time in Japan. He won by 19 shots <laughs> because that's all he did. Uh, well, he grew and, up as a golfer. He yeah, he grew, he grew up yeah. in the golf. But yeah, I played the last two years, but I played... I was the only corporal that came through the gate and they saluted me because I was always in the general's car with the little flag going like this <laughs> with the two stars on it and they thought the general was in there, hell it was me back there drinking, drinking Asahi beer and smoking a cigarette and I'm going back to the base. There are, there are so many Lee Trevino stories and I want yeah. you to tell, tell the story you told me about earlier. You tell me you want to tell the, the, uh, the, uh, oh. the king story. You know, the thing about it, Jacob, you got to understand that golf has taken me. It's like what caddying did for you. Golf did the same thing for me. I have played with kings. I've, I've, I've dined and I've partied with Princess Margaret in London. Uh, I mean, you name it, I've done it. I've played with presidents. I, I mean, it's, it's, I've been in the White House, I've been every, it's, it's just been absolutely fabulous. But the best one yet was, was about 1972 or three, and Butch Harmon was the pro in Morocco, at Rabat. And King, King Hassan there was, 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 was his father had, had died, and he had taken over, and he was young, but he was all playing golf. And his father used to teach them how to play. And he wanted to play golf with me. He called Butch and said to Butch, he said, uh, Butch, he says, do you know Mr. Trevino? I'd love to play golf with him. Sure, he calls me up. I flew to Rabat. So I go into the Hilton, and I get there on Tuesday. Come Wednesday, no call to play golf with the king. He's having a war with Syria. So he was fighting something. 
they were fighting over some something, fertilizer some or something. Some small insignificant. They were fighting thing. over some fertilizer or something out in the desert. I don't remember what it was, but he was in the war or something. And I'm sitting in this hotel waiting. So Butch would go out to the course, he and I, and he would, would practice. And uh, we'd hit balls all day. And then come Wednesday, no call. And come Thursday, no call. So I finally told Butch, I said, Butch, listen to me. His Majesty wants to play golf with me. I'm leaving Saturday morning. It's got to be Friday. So Butch calls his, one of his lieutenants or whatever and says, okay, he says, Mr. Trevino's leaving on Saturday. He says, you want to play? You got to play Friday. So sure enough, Friday about 11 o'clock, we get a call. Big old, big old car drives up in front of the hotel and we get in it. We go through the palace gates and I'm being steep. Let me, tell you, and let me tell you, steel went up as high as that roof. It was just -dum 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 -dum. These gates started closing behind us, right? It drives right up to the first tee. He's got a nine-hole golf course inside the palace grounds with a wall around it with some little things like this up on the wall. You know, they're, they're all up there. And he has this, and this, this guy, of course, is lighted. It's got lights on it so he can play at night on this golf course. So we go to the first tee, and there's a little tent out in the first tee, and there's about 75 pair of shoes in this little tent. I thought they were having a, a, a sale, a shoe sale or something. <laughs> so I, I go over to Butch Harmon, and I said, Butch, I said, what the hell are all these shoes doing here? And he says, that's his, his majesty's shoes. He says, they have no clue what he's going to be wearing when he comes out here. So what he does is he comes out dressed for golf, and he points to a pair of shoes, sets in the chair, and the guy puts them on him. I said, oh, that's, that's pretty good. That's cool. So I said, okay. So now we're waiting, and we've got an entourage there. we got a line. we got the general, the colonel. Uh, we got a couple of ministers. Uh, we got about six, seven guys lined up, and then Butch is here, and I'm on the end. Nobody's coming. And all of a sudden, we hear something, and we look up, and some doors about 30, 40 yards down open, and here came some geese, two Shetland ponies, some dogs. Uh, uh, all his pets were inside the palace grounds, and they, he lets them out when he plays golf, in other words, to run on the course. So they said, he's coming, he's coming, because of the thing. And his little brother-in-law, the king is coming at us, and, uh, and he's twirling this cane, and his brother-in-law is just yapping in his ear like this. And all of a sudden, the king notices a face, or he looks, he sees a face he does not notice. And he stopped dead, and he turns his back to me, and he never moves. And the little brother-in-law comes running up to Butch, and he says, who is this? And Butch says, this is Mr. Vino. He says, Mr. Majesty, he says, invited him to play. Goes back, tells the king. The king turns, starts twirling the thing. He gets to the general, and the general grabs his hand, and the general goes, and the colonel grabs the hand, and he goes, and they keep coming down this line, see? And I'm standing here, standing And you're, la you're last. Me, I'm standing here, and I'm looking at Butch, and I'm watching this king coming down this line. And I said, Butch, we're fixing to die. <laughs> and he said, why is that? I said, I ain't kissing no man's hand. I said, I don't give a damn what you tell me. I'm not kissing his hand. And he says, no, you don't have to do that. He says, but, but he says, you got to know something. I said, what is it? He says, you can't talk to him. He has to talk to you first. I said, we're going to die. <laughs> I said, because I got to say something, man. I got to say something. But that was the dumbest experience I've ever had. And then we went out there and we played. And I was so scared of this guy. Because, because I, 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 you know, I mean, I, I don't know the customs, I don't know anything, and I can't talk to him. So every, I hit my drive down there, and I don't, I have, I got 200 yards. And I said to Butch, I said, Butch, how far is it? And his majesty said, it's a seven iron. Hell, I pull out a seven iron. <laughs> <laughs> and I hooded that, bay. I made a four iron out of it. I got that, I'm leaning on this seven iron, I hit it. I hit it about this high with a duck hook, and I ran it up on the green. I played seven holes. You can ask Butch. I played seven holes and birdied five of them with him clubbing me. <laughs> I'm, hitting, I'm hitting seven irons, 200 yards, and four irons, 125. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is, I mean, I, I still talk about that. I mean, this was crazy. The, uh, the other story that I just love i've heard it a hundred times it's in your book 
You've got to tell everybody about when you first met Raymond Floyd. When you were hustling, he was hustling. This is yeah. before the tour. Well, Raymond really was twenty. Money. He was twenty-one. Raymond was. There were some guys in El Paso that found out I could play. They were, what happened was Fred Hawkins was out in El Paso and he was beating these cotton farmers out of all their money, and that was when cotton was really going up. And the, you, you know, the Fabens and the Yusleta, all that little valley down there, it's all irrigated, so it's, it's a big cotton. And they, these farmers had a lot of money, and they had a little golf course out there called Horizon Hills. And Fred Hawkins was out there, which was at the time was playing the, the tour, and he was out there, and he was just beating them up. So this one guy named Martin Letnitz asked a guy in Fort Worth, he says, do you know anyone in Dallas that can play that no one knows? He said, I know this little Mexican guy that works at a driving ring. <laughs> he said, that can really play. And he says, you ought to call him. So the guy called me up. Now, I don't, I don't speak Spanish very well, and, and I understand it better than I can speak it. And the guy gets on the phone, and the guy is Yugoslavian, but he's been living in that valley so long that you thought he was from Mexico, Guadalajara, or somewhere. <laughs> you know, and this guy starts speaking Spanish to me. And I said, sir, sir, I said, you speak English. Hey, chico. And, and, he, and I said, oh, he said, yeah. So he, start, so he tells me the story about playing these guys. So he hires me to play three days for him, to play Fred Hawkins. And I beat Fred Hawkins two days, and he didn't show up for the third day. Well, Raymond at the time was living in Dallas in an apartment, and he also had an apartment here in Chicago at the time because the Cubs are... He was a hot shot. Boy, he loved the Cubs. He loved the Cubs. Yeah. And so he lived here also part-time. So these bookmakers in Dallas that I knew, Fat Mickey and, and Ace Darnell and all those guys, all of a sudden Fat Mickey comes through the pro shop one day. Now, that's 660 miles away from Dallas. Did Fat Mickey know Wink? I guarantee he knew Wink. No, he already did. He, he, he knew did. him. <laughs> he had to know Wink, I guarantee you. <laughs> but anyway, so he comes in and he says, uh, how you doing, baby? How you doing? I said, I'm doing good, Mickey. He said, I hear y'all playing a lot of money out here. Ty, you know who else was with him? Titanic Thompson was with him. And Ty, Titanic was with him. He said, uh, I hear y'all betting a lot of money out here. I said, no, not me. I said, I don't have any money to bet. I'll play. He said, if we bring a touring pro out here, he said, I think they'll bet on you? I said, I don't know. Who are you going to bring? He said, oh, we're going to bring Raymond Floyd. So he went over and talked to Martin Letnich, and Martin said, bring him on. So I'm in the pro shop one day, and we didn't have our pro shop. I mean, it was, I mean, it was, uh, the driveway was just caliche. It, it wasn't paved. So you could hear when a car came in. You could hear it. So all of a sudden, I see this car drive up, and there's a white Cadillac. And I see this guy get out, and he had these powder blue pants on. Looked like they were $500 pants. He had alligator shoes on. He, had a, he had a Wilson bag that weighed 300 pounds if it weighed an ounce and, and, and big. So I grabbed the bag and I put it on a cart and I took it into the locker room. And Raymond comes in and sits down in, in the chair. Hold the and and he's, yeah, he sits in the chair and I unpack his bag. I take his clubs out. I take his shoes out. I clean his shoes over there. And... The other guy, the, our ace, says, I'm going to go get a cart so we can look at the golf course because we're going to play at 1, and this is about noon. And while he's gone, Raymond asked me, he says, who am I playing today? Meanwhile, I, you're, you're packing his bag. No, no, I'm shining his shoes. I'm cleaning the shoes. <laughs> so he says to me, he says, who am I playing today? I said, you're playing me, Mr. Floyd. He said, you? He said, what the hell do you do around here? I said, I do a little bit of everything. <laughs> So he says, and I did. I opened the shop at 5. <clears throat> so he says to me, he said, okay, so we go out and play. And I shoot 65. And I dusted him. But I beat him. Not bad, but I beat him. So he wants to play nine more holes. Emergency nine. <laughs> and I said. Double or nothing. Yeah, he wants to play an emergency nine. So I said to him, I said, Mr. Floyd, I can't. He says, why not? I said, I got to put the cards up. <laughs> so, so now he says, yeah, that's about right. He says, I'm playing the damn cart man, too. He says, uh, so I beat him the next day again. And then on the last day, he beat me on a, he eagled 18, and I lipped it out, and he beat me one up on 18. He beat me one up the next day. And when he went out on tour, he actually told them, he says, I, I, I ran into a little Mexican boy in El Paso. He says, y'all going to have to make a little room for him. You know? <laughs> I, got a, I got a great story. <laughs> Bob, Goldby, Bob Goldby's son is sitting here, and he, he was gracious enough to come over and say hello to me, and I've met him before. 
But his dad, we tell this story all the time because his dad, Bob Goldby, as you well know, a hell of a player. Uh, I, I thought he got a, a little better the bad part of it when he won the Masters. He really didn't get all the credit that, that he should have gotten because Roberto signed the wrong card. But what difference does it make? You know, I mean, that's his fault. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, so he says, uh, so I had finished fifth at Balderstraw. And, and the next week we were playing Aurora in, 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 in Cleveland. And I was hitting balls, and Nicholas walked up behind me, and they're all looking at me hitting these balls, you know. And I got, I mean, I looked like, you know, my swing made Furyk swing look like Gene Littler, you know. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm looping this thing around, you know. So anyway, so so they're watching me, and they're not very far behind me, and 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 uh, and uh, they asked Nicholas, you know, they said, "What do you think?" And Nicholas said, "Well, he said, you know what? He said it's not the greatest swing I've ever seen. He said, but it repeats." And I mean, Bob Goldby says, he'll linger, but he won't last. <laughs> that's what exactly, he said? That's what he said. Oh, no. And we still use that, and, he, and his son was just telling me, he said, Dad says, you're always saying that about him. <laughs> <laughs> well, not to bring up a, a bad subject, I know you talked about it in the press, uh, press meeting a little bit earlier, but 1975, Western Open, you and yeah. Jerry Heard were waiting out a rain delay on the yeah. 13th hole at Butler National, right. and you got hit by lightning. Yeah. Um, my Can you talk, you talk us through that a little bit? Well, it's my fault, Peter, and I'm glad you asked that question because I, I, I wanted to tell everybody here uh, that be careful what you wish for. And seriously, when I tell you this, and I'm going to tell you this story. And for people that are non-believers, you understand, because I, I died that day, and, and he told me he had enough pros up there already. He had the merit and <laughs> all these people. He said, I don't need you. I don't need you up here. And, I mean, I saw the other side. It was wonderful. It was a hell of a lot better than here. It was really nice. It was really nice. But I wanted to tell you what happened here. We played the U.S. Open at Medina the week before. And then we just came across, and we're going to play Butler for the Western Open at the time. And I remember I'm standing on the first tee at Medina. And it started cracking. It started lightning and raining, and it started getting bad, and I hadn't teed off yet, and there were about 10,000 people on the tee watching us. And I'm sitting there talking to them, entertaining them. And a security guy comes out of the clubhouse and told me to get back in the clubhouse because they told me that all the players had to go in. And I, I, I said to him, I said, listen, what about the people that are standing here? Where are we putting them? And he says, well, I don't know about the people. He said, they told me to bring you in. And I said, I'll tell you what, forget it. I'm going to stay right here and entertain my people. And by the way, I said, don't worry about it. I said, I'll take a one iron out, just hold it up. I said, because God can't even hit a one iron. <laughs> now, you know what happened the next Friday on the 13th hole at Butler? I got zapped. But you had an eight iron. I had a six iron. Okay. Part three. Hit it three feet. Yeah. And I'll tell you what. And I, I, I went down there, and the problem is that we set, I sat next. It hit the lake is what it did. It hit the lake and went out. Hit me, Jerry Hurd. Jerry Hurd never played again. He was a hell of a player, as you well know. Yeah. And Jerry Hurd would have been a, 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 a superstar. Bobby Nichols also Bobby didn't Nichols get hit. Bobby Nichols had hit. But Bobby Nichols you, was already, uh, you know, a little bit this way. He was there. already <laughs> up there. He, uh, <laughs> you won five majors in a seven-year period, but after that, you only won one major more, yeah. the 84 PG. After, after the light. After the surgery and everything. Yeah. Uh, what do you think that did? Obviously, it, it, it burned out the discs in your back. Yeah, and, yeah. I've, and, had, uh, I've had four back operations. I have, I have two steel rollers in my back. I have a steel plate in my neck. Um, but you learn to play around your hurts. Oh, you have to change the swing. That's what Tiger's going to have to do. Tiger can't have a doctor or a guru telling him how to swing a golf club. He's going to have to come back, get off in the corner, get a radio, listen to some music, hit some golf balls, and figure out a way that he's going to come back and play again. Now, Tiger Wood is Tiger Woods. He hasn't lost his talent. All he's, all, he's been hurt. And he's going to have to learn to play around that hurt and figure out how he's going to do it. Yeah, there's no, I heard you say, there's no swing instructor going to tell him how he feels hitting a golf ball. He's got to figure that out. Can't. And, and first of all, he's never had an instructor that could beat him. How in the hell can you listen to somebody you can't beat? <laughs> I, I mean, I, that's why I never had anybody. I never, if I'd have found somebody that could beat me, I'd have taken a lesson from him. 
you know, but, but I, <laughs> this is crazy. I don't understand that. I don't, <clears throat> you take it, let me tell you something. You take it out of the dirt. You understand? You, you get out. You got to dig it out of the dirt. I mean, if you want to be good at, you got, I don't care what Jacob's doing in school, you know? If somebody gives him the answers to all the tests and everything, go take the test, he'll pass that test, but he doesn't even know what the hell he passed. You got to work at it, see? It's the same thing in golf, in so what, business, everything. No shortcuts. So based on that, how do you feel the direction of the PGA Tour is going with all the gurus, with all the fitness, all the mental coaches, all the video? The players don't really own their swings, do they? They don't own anything. I mean, I, I don't understand... Listen, they're going now to press conferences, and they've got masseuse. They've got a, they got a guy that, that, that tells them what to say. Uh, they've, they've got a guy that... that what to eat. What they to eat. Middle, yeah. and, and are you kidding me? A six-pack of beer and a bucket of fried chicken, and I'd, I'd kick your <laughs> ass tomorrow in a minute. Hey. <laughs> are you crazy? So as John, John will tell you, when these... When John will tell you, when these guys come to town... Back in the day, you know, your posse was you and Herman and Claudia. That was it. That was your posse. Now guys come to town with their team. They come with six, seven, eight guys, right? I mean, it's just crazy. They want courtesy cars. Yeah, Nobody they want, and they want their towels with their initials on them and everything. I mean, they just, huh? They want them heated. I went in to get a car one time, and the guy brought it back because the color wasn't right. Free car, Cadillac. Guy said, no, I don't like the color. You got another one? Yeah. That, that, that. I, I moved him out of the way, and I said, just give me a car. I don't care what color it is. Back in the old days when we used to pay those range balls, and if you didn't hit them all, you $8. put them in your bag. We paid $8 <laughs> for the golf. We, we, remember the late Rod Funsett? He was so tight, he never bought a bucket of balls. He was, he, he, he was like a, 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 he would just stand around and wait till somebody left three or four, and then he'd warm up, <laughs> and he'd warm up. He wouldn't. We paid eight bucks, eight dollars for range balls. Hey, talking about caddies here tonight, huge part of this. Tell us a little bit about a PGA Tour caddy. Does, it, does a tour caddy get too much credit or not enough? And, and how impactful was Herman Mitchell in your life and in your game? Herman Mitchell, it was a different era, and it was different back then. The first time I had Herman Mitchell on my bag, we were playing Pensacola, Florida. A dog leg right, Pensacola Country Club. And I drove it through. I didn't cut it, and it went through in the trees. And I'm in the trees about 15 feet, and I got a duck hook at 130 yards on the green. And he's trying to get me to chip it out. This is our, this is our introduction. And he was caddying for Miller Barber at the time before when I got him. And I hit my sand wedge, and I took it and I put it back and I went like this. And it was like Bubba Watson, you remember at Augusta. The, yeah, out of the trees. Way, I went this way. And I knocked it on the green. And I swear to you, Herman looked at me and he says, I can't club you. <laughs> I said, what did you say? He said, I can't club you. I said, you're not supposed to club me. I said, you're supposed to tell me which way the wind is blowing and how far it is to the hole. I said, I do the clubbing. Don't you worry about the clubbing. Because I, 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 was, I was a mechanic. I, I, could, I did that to Willie Aitchison in the British Open. I went to the British Open, and I went to Burkdale, and I'm playing a practice round, and they gave me this caddy, and I get to the second hole, and I said, uh, is there any problems on this hole? And he said, but it's the right. I said, oh, <laughs> He says, a bottom to, right. to the right. So there's an American standing there next to the, on the fence there, next to the rope, and he says, he said, uh, there's a creek on the right side. <laughs> the guy's telling me there's a burn to the right. He said, it's a creek. I said, oh, okay. So I come to nine. So I come to nine, and it's a blind shot up the tongue. So I says, where do you hit it here? He said, he said hit it to my head. Oh, uh, I said, oh. So the guy standing there again, he said, the tent. I said, oh, marquee, he was saying. I said, okay. So I went into the caddy master, and I said, hey, listen, I said, this isn't going to work. I said, this guy, this isn't going to work. I said, I, I, we're having a little problem here. So he gives me Willie Aitchison, which caddied for me forever. Yeah. Willie Aitchison was a hell of a caddy. Won 67, uh, the 67 Open with Roberto. He won five amateur championships with 
Benelic. I have no clue why he didn't have a bag. So 10 now is a little dog leg left, down the hill, up the hill. So I hit a five wood down there, perfect. I get down there, and I says, how far is this? He said, seven iron. I said, what'd you say? He said, seven iron. I said, give me three more balls. So I got four balls. I hit five wood, pitching wedge, five iron, three wood. And I hit them all on the green. I said, from now on, when I ask you for a yardage, I want a yardage. I do the clubbing. <laughs> you couldn't club me. And, and, but we, Herman and I, Herman and I, we had a sideshow. You did? Pe yeah. People oh. actually thought that we were going to kill ourselves out there. I, I had women, I had ladies come up to me and she says, do you treat him that bad all the time? I said, listen, ma'am, if he doesn't do his job, I said, let me tell you what. I said, you want to take him home with you? <laughs> you know, that's what I tell him. I said, you want to take him home? You can have him. You can mow your lawn, whatever you want to do. He said, take he's him a, with he's you. He's a big fella, Herman, about 320 Herman, pounds. Herman would look at him, 370. He was 370. Yeah. <laughs> We'd get in the car, we laugh like hell. We'd let me tell you, I got to tell this quick story because Fluff, Mike Cowan, and I worked for 20 years, and we'd play with Lee and Herman, and we'd get out in the fairway and Fluff, and I loved it because we knew it was coming. Lee would say, what, what, do, what do you think? I think it's a five iron. And Herman would look at him and go, five iron? You can't get there with a five wood. <laughs> and he'd look at him and go, you're crazy. I think I can get there with a six iron. And they were doing it to entertain everybody. Yeah, yeah. You thought, yeah. and Fluff and I sat there, we just giggled because it was Great he, he was He was one of the finest. I, I took care of when, he, when I retired him because he had congested heart failure. And I retired him and I put him on a $25,000. I gave him a year, bought him a car. He bought him a little house in Pensacola. Then he beat me up for another three or 4000 a year. <laughs> he, 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 played, he played more golf than I did. He was living in, in, in Pensacola, Florida. But the thing that I remember him most is when I won the PGA in 84 at Shoal Creek in Alabama. And he had gout, and he couldn't walk. And he had this white coverall on. He looked like the good humor man walking around. And he was walking around like this, just like this. And he had the bag. I said, Herman, I'll get another caddy. You, you, you don't have to caddy today. I, 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 don't worry about it. He said, you're going to win this tournament. It's the last day, and I know you're going to win, and I've never won a major. He said, I want to win a major. So we're leaving the putting green. And we're walking up to the tee, and there's a man sitting on a little chair, big guy. And he had a tobacco on his jaw, and it was sticking out to here. And he had that deep voice. And, he, and you know, I'm quick as a cat. And, and, and he looked at me, and he says, hey, Lee. He said, what do you feed that catty? I said, rednecks. <laughs> and, and, and as soon as I said rednecks, Herman says, and I'm getting hungry, too. <laughs> But I, he passed away. He was, a, he was a great. He was a great. I still guy. miss him. He was family. Yeah. Hey, I we know. just have a few more minutes, but I just want to touch on humor. Obviously, has been at the heart of your career. That's why I was always drawn yeah. to, to you and to Fuzzy and to Chi Chi. Yeah. Some of your quotes. One time when you were playing with Tony Jacklin in a major yeah. championship, walking off the first tee. No, that was the that that, that was the the world match play. We we're playing the uh, third round. Tell, the, tell what happened. We're going, tell to the the quote. Fir, we're going to the first tee, and it's a 36 hole finals, uh, no, thir semifinals. And Tony walks up next to me and he says, They call me Mex. And he says, Hey, Mex. He says, I don't want to talk today. You know? And I, I, I told you I was quick. So I just looked at him and I said, You don't have to talk, just listen. <laughs> Another one with Gary Player. You were telling Gary that if it wasn't for golf, you didn't know what you'd be doing. Because if your IQ had been two points lower, you'd have been a plant. I'd somewhere. have been a tree. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then the one iron quote was great. Yeah. Uh, the, on the Champions Tour, I love this. A nice thing about the Champions Tour is we can take a cart and a cooler. Yeah. If your game isn't going well, you can always have a picnic. You can have a picnic. I mean, these guys had everything on there, man. Yeah. And last one here. I'm in the woods so much I can tell you which plants are edible. <laughs> I never got in the trees much. I was, I was I pretty know. straight. I was pretty straight. I just have to, one last thing. You told me a long time ago that the great players create the atmosphere that they want to play in. Mm -hmm. And I think Jack did that. Mm -hmm. Hogan did that. Mm -hmm. Ice cold. 
you do that. You create a fun, positive atmosphere that mm -hmm. if somebody like Jack or Tiger doesn't like it, they don't mm -hmm. have to get involved. No. But you create it. And that helped me a lot because I'm gregarious like you are. You're like you me. You're, you're, you're entertaining. Yeah. And I've always, done, I've always felt that that's a huge part of what I mm -hmm. gained from, from playing and learning from you. But did you, you, do you use that to break the tension or to... Not really. Not really. I use natural? That. No, I think that when people are paying their money to come and see you, not only are they looking for good golf shots, but they're looking for a little bit of entertainment. I had a problem with it at first because they were making too much of the autographs and the pictures and touching you and doing this and all that stuff. And I said, I don't understand what the hell they're doing this for and everything. And I, I actually went to professional help to ask them. And I asked them, and the guy across the desk says to me, he says, Lee, he said, you do something very well. And, it, and, and, it, and, and, and they, they like what you do. And they just kind of want to be a part of it. And I had no problems with it ever since. It's just like what Gary did. We're playing with, with, with Jack and I and Gary are playing in Minneapolis, St. Paul uh, this year. And we're playing a, a scramble, uh, you, you know, and, and, and everything. And we go to this cocktail party, and we, we're out driving Jack, okay? So Gary and I, so Gary, so I says to Gary at the cocktail party, I says to him, I said, Gary, I said, did you ever think think that you would live to see the day that we could outdrive Jack Nicholas? And Gary says, did you ever think you would see the day to where we would be taller than him? <laughs> I'm telling you, unbelievable. But, we're, you know, we have, you know, the great thing about, about this is that you must laugh. Laughter is absolutely the greatest medicine in the world. Is you've got to laugh. You got to have fun, and 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 we do it every day. You know, I, every day with my wife hates me. Not she doesn't hate me, but anyway, she says you're not funny. You know, you're not funny. She says she says I've heard all that stuff before, but when I put that when I bought that she bought me a coffee pot. Right, and I pushed the button to put the coffee, and I put the cup in upside down, and the coffee went all on the floor. She said, "Now that's funny." <laughs> that's, that's, that's funny. Uh, thank you, Lee. Thanks for being here. Thank you, everybody, for your support. I love you. A nice hand for Lee Trevino. Thank you. All right.